Hello, this is Clint again, and over the weekend, I was thinking a lot about your boy Zach and why he is such an enemy to Marvel and other mainstream publisher publishers. And yeah, I think it's illustrated in a couple different articles, a couple different sources I looked at. Uh, but a little while ago, uh, Bleeding Cool mentioned that you know they ranked your boy Zach eighty three on the list of the hundred most influential people in comics. And at the time, like when this article was written, he had 50,000 subscribers. Now he has uh, almost double that. But this is really when I think a lot of the frustration and the worry came over diversity in comics. And yeah, I, I found that really interesting because large publishers, large corporations, uh, educational institutions they like to rely on so-called expert knowledge for what makes good comics and what makes uh, you know good diverse representation in comics yeah this is just one example you hear a lot about the pushback at least i do because i'm you know on the side of comicsgate i hear a lot about the pushback against all the awful things uh, that they're doing to comics uh, trying to force an ideology into those comics but on the other end of that fight, there are a lot of so-called experts that are asking for that ideology to be there. And so Marvel, in a way, is stuck in the middle. You know, I'm sure they feel like they're trying to make everyone happy. Really, they're trying to make one side of the coin happy. Um, but if we look through this at the so-called expert advice, first, they did mention um, when they started talking at a, a leadership conference at Comic-Con, they had two re retailers complaining about blacks, homos, and freaking females. And they put those in quotes, but they didn't attribute those to any individuals. So I, I'm always going to be suspicious of how these things are mentioned. How did these retailers bring it up? Maybe they were uh, super blunt and ham-fisted about their, their complaints. Uh, but I always am going to question it because they, these are unattributed quotes. So let's look at what some of these experts have to say. First, so again, all of them, all these experts are answering the same question. They're giving Marvel a grade on how they've, yeah, what grade would you give Marvel's diversity efforts over the past three years and why? So first we have David F. Walker. He's a comic book writer of Power Man and Iron Fist. Okay, so experts. I always wonder too, when it comes to diversity, there are different kinds of experts that are brought in. A lot of them might be uh, college professors that teach a variety of gender studies, uh, race studies, so on and so on. Uh, these are just, uh, you know, random co comic pros at different places um, with jobs. So I don't know why that makes them experts, but we'll go with it for now. First, we have B minus. I see them trying really hard. There's tons of room for improvement. So that's like the, the literally the safest answer you could give to not make anybody upset. Next, we have Milton Greep, president and chief executive of ICV2. He gives them an A. It's been a really good effort. They've done a lot of rolling those characters out. I give them a lot of credit for what they've done, what they've tried to do. You know, a lot of these quotes just sound like they cornered these people in the hallway or, you know, just did some random interview and threw a recorder in their face. And they're sort of just giving a diplomatic answer. So that, to me, this is so far from an expert opinion, an actual analysis of anything. It's just, um, yeah, they ran a random comment. Next, we have Jeff Ayers, manager of New York City comic book store Forbidden Planet. So uh, the comic book store manager, he gives them a B. Now notice the other retailers they're mentioning, those are comic book store managers or owners or whatever. Uh, and they were not given expert status. So I don't understand what makes this particular comic book manager an expert and the other ones not an expert, but we'll give them the benefit of a doubt. B, they've done a hell of a lot better job than they had been. That's coming from not the best place to start with. Okay, again, all of these are so diplomatic. They're just trying to say, like, there's so much more to go. There's so much work to do. Work. Again, that's that's a word that always comes up. Okay, and then we've got a C minus from uh, Regine L. Sawyer, owner, writer, creator, and uh, yeah, C minus. You're seeing a lot of this stuff that's old hat or a retelling of a story because those brands are tried and true. They think that that's what continuously builds a brand, and it's not. 
what continually builds our brands are new voices and new stories. Okay, now I I actually don't disagree with that. That uh, that makes sense to me. Tell new stories and and have new voices. My only thing I'd add to that is make sure that they're good stories and good voices. Somebody that knows what they're doing and can tell a story well, then yeah, go for it. I I actually agree with that. And next we have Kwanzer. Uh, because he's a comic book creator, therefore he is an expert. C plus Marvel is in a world that is relatively utopian. Yeah, I disagree. That's I disagree with that completely. It's one of those things that you're kind of glad they're becoming aware of this, but they need more experienced hands handling these books. More experienced in what? More experienced writers? Um, if that was the case, then yeah, I mean, if you're just hiring a random white writer because of the color of their skin or their gender, then actually, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. If you're talking about experience, meaning they can't be the dreaded straight white man or, you know, whatever it might be, whatever experience you're, you're hoping for, uh, that, that seems really silly to me. Next one, we have Zora Gilbert, co-writer of dates. Now, <laughs> as a writer, I, I mean, it's okay if you want to do co-writing. Uh, to me, that's miserable. I never, I will never, ever co-write. Don't ask me to do it because I won't. Uh, there needs to be one writer. I'm, it, I don't know how people do that, but I digress. So C minus. I think Marvel is doing some good things, but by and large, they are not committing. The books I love, those people are doing a really good job. How are they not committing? That's what I'm not sure about. This doesn't have enough explanation to me. I mean, this is supposed to be an expert opinion. And it's just, it doesn't make sense to me. Now, I don't want to spend every single video, every single time that I criticize uh, diversity and how it's being handled. I really want to make it clear, and I hate that I always have to do this, but I, I still feel the need to. And that is to recognize that I have no problem. I'm not a white nationalist. I'm not a racial nationalist. I hate identity politics. So with, when there are people of any color, any race that are succeeding in sports, arts, comics, anything. Um, if they're doing a great job, I, man, I'm, I'm happy about it. You've got all sorts of examples of, of men that are diverse, women that are diverse, all sorts of examples, comics and elsewhere, where people haven't had a problem. There hasn't been a backlash. It's only recently because of the political ideology. There's a difference between accepting people for what they are and and enjoying what they have to offer and being upset with somebody's political beliefs being pushed upon you so you can sort of see how the big publishers are sort of caught in between these two forces and the reason why they're so upset with comic skate they're so upset with your boy zach is because it's representing a more powerful opposition they aren't expecting it. They're hoping that that kind of opposition is just dead um, because on the other side, on the far left, there is an extreme push for this, this kind of change. And they feel, they feel a lot of pressure to make these changes. Uh, so this is just a little tidbit. I'm going to make some comments about it. When somebody tells me that they don't see race, I say, I mean, that's fine. You know, you can choose not to see the sky, but it exists. Okay, so race exists. I don't think anybody, when they say they don't see race, I don't think they mean they literally don't see race unless maybe you're blind. In that case, you really wouldn't see race. But, you know, usually when I hear people say that, they mean that it's not important. It is such a minor thing in the big picture that it doesn't affect your interactions with other people. Um, now, you know, I, know th I think to varying degrees that can be true. But yeah, this is another, it's just sort of, deflecting the argument of of people that are saying that they don't see race meme review i'm told i was four years old when i turned to my mom and i said well you know when am i going to turn white i was consuming and engaging with media and culture around me a lot of cartoons a lot of kids tv comics etc etc and while well, all the good people were white and i considered so this is an interesting concept of wishing or being confused that you're a different color of person and i think that might have to do with media it also has to do with culture but when you live in a place like the united states of america there really is there are a lot of people of different races um, ethnicities 
everything. They're different people. You know, I could definitely see that there's nothing wrong with wanting to watch a movie or read a book or a comic and that features characters that resemble you. That's fine. If that is all you can read and you don't want to read anything else or you have a problem with that, then to me, you are a racial nationalist and I have a problem with that. But this is really no different than, uh, you know, people like Rachel Dolezal, who famously pretended to be a black woman when she is, in fact, a white woman. There's sort of, I mean, if you identify with a certain culture or you feel like that culture is better, and certainly today there is a lot of uh, hatred toward and scapegoating of white straight men. It, it's obvious why there would be these kinds of conflicts and problems. Some of that friction happens when you have a lot of different people that look differently all living in the same country. It's just sort of a byproduct. I did myself to be a good person. I realized at that early age that to be white was to be human. I was attempting to discuss race in white dominated circles and really getting nowhere. I wrote a blog post. Um, I titled it, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. Let's say we were having a broad conversation about inequality. As soon as I um, tried to raise the topic of race, there was an almost immediate clamp down, shut down denial from my conversation partner. They tried to find ways to convince me that absolutely no race had nothing to do with it, that actually I had a chip on my shoulder. Well, what did you though? I mean, there's race has... I mean, sure, sure, it can have factors, but there's honestly no way to know. And this is this is a thing, a big lie that we get is that if somehow you can fix representation in comics, that that's going to fix any kind of little injustices, that this is going to sort of change the, the playing ground, the level of the playing field. Um, and it's, it's not true. There's, it's unmeasurable. You cannot measure it. So you could either choose to be upset about it and to start conversations randomly with people um, to try and and teach them about it or you can just live your life and and do something do something good with your life do what you want to do and if if your race gets in the way if it's legitimately stopping you or somebody's stopping you because your race man report it but complaining about it to groups random groups of people that doesn't work in fact you're going to get the opposite effect Um, and that, you know, why was I trying to make everything about race? I'd actually decided to have a conversation with a person who I would can now confidently say is probably is a white anti-racist, a white critical anti-racist. Probably. So you you might have a friend that, you know, they're on board with your ideology, but you still want to leave that window open just in case they're not anti-racist just in case they really are racist and they're just pretending not to be. See, this is the kind of, it's ridiculous. If somebody says that they're not racist and they've given you no reason to believe that they are racist, give them the benefit of the doubt. They're not racist. And I spoke to her about her journey and I said, well, what's led to you being somebody who is so aware of how race shapes inequality. She said that a lot of her defensiveness initially when it came to these conversations about race was a fear of being wrong. You know, a fear of, uh, she said a lot of it was to do with her ego. So a lot of these discussions, they end up being about inequality. That's really what this is about. That is, uh, yeah, what's the, the wizard behind the curtain, the man behind the curtain. It's about inequality. Okay, so now we're talking about something completely different. If you're talking to me about people having racial uh, prejudices and and holding people back or uh, hurting people or you know anything like that, that's wrong. And I think the vast majority of the country and the world believes that that's wrong to some degree. Now, when you're talking about inequality, you're talking about something totally different. You're talking about Marxism. Now you're not talking about race. Race is just the vehicle for Marxism to be introduced into the conversation today. You've probably seen either this image or one very similar to it. And this is equality, equity, whatever they call all of this is nonsense. This this kind of visualization is wrong because this is a, a ridiculous oversimplification for what life is. So if everybody has an equal block. That's equality, right? And, and that's actually the word she used. So now equity is trying to be the new word that means 
equality of outcome, right? Everybody's seeing over the fence because, and the blocks aren't important. Well, the truth is privileges aren't measured in equal units. It is impossible. You cannot tell me those, the same person with the same, born into the same kind of life experience, if that person is black, Asian, or white, you cannot possibly measure the outcome of their life, how it would be different. Same with a man and a woman. You can't possibly measure that. And even if you could measure that, you can't blame it on society. You can't blame it on your friends that happen to be straight and white or male or whatever. You can't you can't blame it on anybody because the hard reality is, is that is just life. It's not fair. I don't want anybody to be unfairly disadvantaged. I don't think anybody wants that to happen. But making a plight for equality uh, and using race as a leverage or racism as a tool to get people on board with this, this type of thinking, that's not helping anybody. What you have to do is make yourself valuable. You have to bring value to society and society will value you. And so this is a little article I found explaining white privilege to a broke white person. Have you ever sat through one of these trainings where someone tries to, to tell you this? I mean, I, I have to do this all of the time sit through these and it's really hard to keep my mouth shut uh but i i don't want to lose my job i don't want to get in, in trouble with it but uh yeah i mean th this is this is disgusting it says years ago some feminist on the internet told me i was privileged wth i said i came from the kind of poor that people don't want to believe still exists in this country have you ever spent a frigid northern illinois winter without heat or running water i have at 12 years old were you making ramen noodles in a coffee maker with your water you fetched from a public bathroom? I was. Have you ever lived in a camper year-round and used a random relative's apartment as your mailing address? We did. Did you attend so many different elementary schools that you could only remember a quarter of their names? Welcome to my childhood. So when that feminist told me that I had white privilege, I told her that my white skin didn't do anything to prevent me from experiencing poverty. Now, the sad thing about this article is that it actually turns around. Uh, the individual that is speaking here has come to grips with their white privilege and, and changed, changed their mind about it. And here are some of the examples, right? Because of the color of their skin. I can turn on the television or open the front page of the paper and see people my race widely represented. Now, seeing someone your race wild, widely represented, I mean, ma sure, maybe that's great seeing people of other races widely represented it i mean you cannot measure how that changes someone's life and in my opinion it's extremely minor it's very minor when i'm told about our national heritage or about civilization i am shown that the people of my color made it what it is people that look like you created your civilization if you live in a different civilization they're going to look different if a traffic cop pulls me over or the IRS audits my tax return, I can be sure I haven't been uh, singled out because of my race. Can you be sure, though? I mean, you're just saying that you, you can be sure. In fact, it, actually, if you're conservative, if you're conservative and you own a nonprofit organization, actually, you can be sure that you are being targeted by the IRS. I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people my, of my race most of the time. This is true with essentially everybody, and, I mean, and people do do it. You have freedom of association, and that's, I mean, that's a natural part of human behavior is you usually live next to people that look and think like you, or at least primarily. I lived in Detroit for a while, and you could definitely see that. You go from neighborhood to neighborhood, and you would get certain races of people that all lived in the same areas. It's part of human nature. I'm not going to say that it's good or bad because everybody does it. So what does the comic industry have left to do? They've got to make the, these experts, the so-called experts, happy. They've decided that that's important to them. What they didn't expect is that there would be so much backlash from people. So this, I think, is why the mainstream comic publishers are so worried about diversity in comics. Not only that he's speaking out against these things, but that there are so many of us that are that are in support of him okay so I wanted to do a little update on the comic that I'm writing I have put in a lot of work this week writing the script 
I am really, really liking it. Um, but I promise I'm not going to, I'm not going to rush it. I really want to make this really good. Uh, so I'm also realizing that I was hoping that the title selection would be nice and really clean. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't been that way. So from our voting, Downcast was the title that went really well. But I'll tell you, I had just as many votes for Downcast. I had suggestions for new uh, titles. And so I decided to throw up a list of four. I included Downcast. I've got Deep Sky, Spiral Heights, and Uplift. I already vetted these, and they seem like they would be good for Googling, especially if you're Googling them in terms of comic books. And I'll be honest, I'm I'm liking this list a little better as it gets narrowed down. Let me know what you think in the comments. I think I'm just going to go ahead and probably pick one. I'm going to give it a day or two and at least just make it the working title. What I really want is just to pick the correct title, make it something that can be marketable, make it something that people are going to like. And so I'm probably just going to end up picking one, but let me know what you think. Thank you so much for all your support. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. I could really use the subscriptions. I'm really getting close to a thousand subscribers and that's when things really heat up and I'm going to be able to, to have more power with getting a great artist and bringing you new comics that are not going to try and tell you how to think or feel. So thank you. I'll see you next time.